What is up you guys? Welcome back to Tidal Gardens. In this video, we are doing a major reworking of this greenhouse. Now this greenhouse, it is over 20 years old and it served us very well over this time. But the layout of the greenhouse is something that I've been wanting to change now for about 10 years at least. The layout of the tanks made sense when we initially did it about 20 years ago, but I've learned a lot of things since then. And unfortunately, because of how we originally set up those tanks, it was very difficult to break them down to a point where I could do a major reshuffle like this. But finally, that day is here. I'm super pumped about this. Let's take a look. All right, let's go over what was wrong with that old design. The three original sets were about a thousand gallons a piece. They ran east-west. And looking at it now, I really wish that they went north-south. Because if they went north-south, you can kind of imagine a center walkway going all the way down the middle of the building. And that's really desirable because we have this big giant exhaust fan at the far end, that south end of the greenhouse. And it would basically make for this unobstructed wind tunnel going right down the middle. Also, just the way that people kind of interact with this greenhouse, they do most of their looking at corals down the middle. And as soon as you run perpendicular into that first set, traffic basically stops. So having kind of like full access to the full length of the building, I think there's going to be a lot of benefits to that. All right, going all the way back to the beginning. We originally started out with just these Rubbermaid stock tanks. At the time, they made a ton of sense because they were very robust. They were very cheap. They were less than a dollar per gallon, which is kind of like the mental standard for a good deal when it comes to water volume. Being Rubbermaid stock tanks, they went flat on the ground and we grew our corals directly in them. Looking back at it, it made sense. It made sense at the time, but since then, we started to add glass tanks to these systems, and it became very, for lack of a better word, clear that that was the way to go, that there are some serious disadvantages to having basically knee-height tanks that you can't see into from the sides. So already, I wanted to move away from that. But unfortunately, because the fact that these things were the primary aquaculture tanks, the corals in there made maintenance hell. There could have been some systemic problems in those systems. And because we're not able just to take all the fish, all the corals out, all the substrate out, whatever needed to be done and fully reset those tubs, those problems basically became forever problems. We simply could not hit the reset button on those very easily. The other thing that kind of made it tricky to do maintenance was the multi-levelness of this whole setup. We started off with the Rubbermaids, and then as we started adding glass tanks, we wanted to maximize floor space, and so those glass tanks turned into multi-level glass tanks. Back then, it made sense to try to maximize floor space, but fast forward to now, we don't really have quite that issue because we have this other building even. And so now we are prioritizing ergonomics and ease of maintenance. So multi-level basically means that there's no tank at the optimum height. Either it is a little bit too low or it's a little bit too high. We've come to realize that having the perfect tank height made a huge difference when it came to maintenance. The perfect height for me is just under my armpit level. That way my shoulder isn't strained or anything like that. But it's a little bit lower than that because I happen to be the tallest person at work here. And so we kind of chose a height that fits most people. And also, most importantly, because there is no tank that's like above head height, essentially, there's no longer a need to have footstools everywhere. And just removing the need for footstools dramatically clears up the floor space. We have these 150-gallon sumps, and these are also Rubbermaid stock tanks. We greatly underestimated just how much space was needed for all the equipment. If you can believe it, 
We originally had submersible skimmers in these sumps as well. There are return pumps, there are heating and cooling coils. Long story short, these things became jam-packed, absolutely jam-packed. The absolute worst thing about having a sump that is this jam-packed is when a fish eventually jumps in there. And then we have to somehow catch this fish in this labyrinth of stuff. It is so challenging. In this new system, we will be using 300 gallon Rubbermaid stock tanks as the sump. Now, previously, we did say how it was not great to have these 300 gallon Rubbermaid stock tanks, but that was in the context of growing corals in them. As an equipment sump, not nearly as bad because I've got no problem completely draining that thing, hosing it out, whatever we need to do to reset it. The last thing I'll bring up about the sump area is where do we put the external equipment, the things like the reactors, the UV sterilizers, the ozone generators when we decide to use those, external protein skimmers, all these things. We kind of did a makeshift shelf out of fiberglass, but the future design has to incorporate quite a large stand just to hold all the external equipment. Okay, cinder blocks. They were great at the time. They held up really well over the years. I mean, many of these things are well over 10 years old. They are starting to crumble a little bit, and they are no fun to stack and try to get level and everything like that. But they did serve their purpose quite nicely. Unfortunately, they are really bulky also, and they project into walkways more than I would like. I think we just outgrew cinder blocks. Like we are well on our way to aluminum stands and the greenhouse is going to be no different. I think having these really elegant aluminum stands is the way to go. When we first started out, we could not afford luxuries like extruded aluminum. But now that we kind of have a little bit of a budget to work with, there are so many advantages going from a combination of wood and cinder blocks to aluminum. Okay, looking now at the new layout, we repurposed many of the glass aquariums that were previously in that double decker. I do have to point out that when we took down those glass tanks, we didn't just clean them up and throw them back onto an aluminum stand. We made some modifications. The first modification that we did was we added a full Euro brace to the top of the tank. Over the years, I have become a very big fan of Euro bracing. Obviously, there are some structural components there, but mainly, I like the ergonomics of being able to set stuff on them, and also, they do a really good job of preventing fish jumping out. Fish can still make it out. It is only like a two, three inch Euro brace, but the number of fish that it prevents from jumping out is so worth it. The other modification that we made was I wanted to paint as much of it black as possible. The back and one side, the two sides that kind of face each other, are painted black in a commercial epoxy. The reason for that is that I've noticed that a lot of fish get a little bit too freaked out because there's almost like too many sight lines. And in these shallower tanks, the fish tend to be more skittish anyway. So when they're a little bit more closed in feeling, they calm down more. This system still has that peninsula look to it, but half the viewing panes are blacked out. We went with the aluminum stands. These are from Alufab, sponsor of Tidal Gardens. Thank you very much. We also decided to go with the casters. We go with the casters on everything, but what might not seem immediately obvious is when it came time to remove the glass tanks, break them down, we rolled these tanks all the way out of this greenhouse into the other building to work on. That way we had the entire floor space open to us. And it is such a luxury to be able to do that. And when we are ready to finally set them back up, we can wheel them all the way back in. And then you can make every little micro adjustment with these aluminum stands and casters. We set up the laser sight lines and got this thing absolutely perfect. One major aspect of this build is getting away from all the janky plumbing that we did previously. It's a funny thing, back 20-something years ago, I fancied myself as a halfway decent plumber. 
And then when it came time to build this new building, we hired professional plumbers. And the plumber that we went with, frankly, he's a plumbing artist. We learned so much about what good plumbing looks like. And since then, we've kind of been doing our own projects to that standard as much as possible. Moving away from what I thought was good plumbing to what is more or less professional plumbing, I was very eager to go and polish all that stuff up. So let's take a quick look at that. Each of these tanks has two holes in it for inch and a half bulkheads. The idea at the time was perhaps one of them would be an input and one of them was, would be an output. But in this configuration, they will both serve as drains. Those drains will go down into a two inch pipe and make their way all the way down to the sump. We threw in unions and true union ball valves so that in a pinch, these tanks can be completely shut off and removed. So let's say one starts leaking and needs to be re-siliconed. Not a big deal. Again, everything comes apart. We can roll this tank all the way outside, clean it up, re-silicone it, bring it back in, reattach it, fire it up. It's all good. The drain lines are secured to the stand using fiberglass unistrut and fiberglass unistrut clamps. In the new building, we use a lot of galvanized and stainless steel unistrut, but that's just because we didn't realize that there was such a thing as fiberglass unistrut. And I think in another one of the videos, one of the YouTube comments had mentioned that, hey, there is a supplier in Buffalo that does unistrut in fiberglass. You should check them out. Check them out. Never looked back since. It's been amazing. And obviously the reason why we want to use fiberglass is because it's so much more resistant to things like salt water. Once into the sump, the plan is to have both of those drains go into an MRC filter roller. In the greenhouse, we've never really dealt with filter socks much or filter rollers. So I think this is gonna be a big step in keeping a lot of detritus under control. All of this is going to be in this 300 gallon rubber weight stock tank. I could have gone fancier and got a very expensive rectangle, but for what we're doing, a Rubbermaid stock tank is by far the most cost-effective thing. And if it bothers me that much in the future, we can always just remove this thing and swap in a fancier sump. I don't really see the point in it, but we could if we wanted to. All right, let's talk a little bit about the return plumbing. For this build, we are using a Deltec E-Flow 16. We love ourselves some German pumps. I would say that the majority of like the really nice pumps in our facility are all biz, but in the greenhouse here, we've actually decided to go with a lot of Deltec. We're trying something new with this particular return system. I wanted to make the plumbing as clean looking as possible. I want to avoid as much clutter as I possibly could. We are sending water from this sump all the way up through the canopy we're actually putting bulkheads into the canopy and it goes over top of the canopy and drops back down into four locations for the tanks. I was a little bit worried about possible leaks and stuff up there, but it is a full canopy. So basically you would have salt water coming over the sides of this canopy. So it's not like the lights or anything like that would get splashed. But I mean, you are sending water overhead. It could be a little crazy. I might live to regret this. I don't know. One thing that cannot be argued is that this looks incredibly clean. Essentially, all the lighting and everything, the wiring will be up in the canopy, and you basically just have these four pipes coming down for the returns. Fast forwarding a little bit, we are finally doing our first hydro test, and we're hydro testing with RO. We wanted to make sure that there were no like major leaks before turning all this into salt water. The only leaks that we really came across was places where we didn't glue yet because we were still doing some design work. For example, we haven't plumbed in the filter roller. We are trying to figure out like the best way to do certain things or like the very last bit of our returns where we're probably going to be putting lock line fan nozzles here and there. The only thing that we had to like stop everything and dry out and redo was that these Rubbermaid stock tanks 
they are drilled at the very bottom and that bulkhead drain assembly at the bottom of these stock tanks not exactly great what we decided to do was slather the thing with silicone sealant stick it all back together and it tends to fix that problem so next steps for this system we still need to do the heating and cooling coils and that will also drop in through the canopy we also have to then redirect our freshwater and saltwater feed lines. The locations of those were kind of custom to go directly into the sump in the old orientation, where now we've kind of like changed everything, we have to replumb all of that. Once all that is done, we can finally have salt water in this and then start to break down the next system over. Again, guys, this was a project about 10 years in the making only because we physically could not reshuffle that much coral before. It took a lot of liquidation. It took a lot of serious planning. And then finally, we had the flexibility to do this change. I'm super excited about finally getting this underway. And hopefully fairly soon here, there's going to be two very polished systems sitting here in this greenhouse. All right, guys, that does it from here. Happy reefing.